Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here today. At Grace Bible Fellowship Church, we pride ourselves in teaching the Bible line at a time, expositionally. So we get to go through the scriptures, and I don't stand up here and pontificate on my favorite political issues, but we go through the scriptures and we teach them in context. And that's hugely important because you can create anything from the scriptures, just like uh, a kidnapper might cut little letters out of a magazine and make a letter, a threatening letter. You can take scriptures and put them together and make them say almost anything you want them to. But we, we're really serious about staying into the word of God and staying tight to the, what the scripture teaches us because we believe that it is that which gives life to us. It is God's word to us. And so we've submitted ourselves to that, and uh, we've been going through the book of Luke, uh, which is Luke's account of Jesus's life, which is uh, fantastic that we would have something as well preserved, and we also have three other uh, perspectives, uh, Matthew, Mark, and John. So as we go through the book of Luke, he's going to have a particular perspective, and he puts things together in a certain way. And uh, I've, I've never taught it here at Grace until just recently, and I'm really enjoying it. I hope you guys are as well. So today we're going to pick it up in chapter 12. Yes. And what do these three things have in common? Uh, they're, they're topics that Jesus is going to talk about believe it or not. In chapter 12, verse 3, Luke writes here, Jesus speaking, therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have spoken in the ear and inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. I read scriptures like that and I go, uh oh, <laughs> because there are things that we whisper sometimes under our breath, you know, like Yosemite Sam and, you know, Rasa fracking, you know. <laughs> and I think, wow. So the things even that I think and that are in my mind and that are lodged in my heart, that there's a time in which that will all be, I mean, it's like the internet. Exposed, everybody there to see it. Um, and it will be shouted from the rooftops. That's, uh, that's an interesting way of looking at things. Just to remind you where we are, it's a small, shameless plug for Grace Bible Fellowship. <laughs> Last week, we talked about hypocrisy. Jesus was facing off with the religious establishment and talking about all of the things that they did to be seen by other people because they put on a performance. Their relationship with God was not so much about what God knew about them or what their life was before him, but it was about having the focus on other people and what other people thought of them. And so it was a big show. And Jesus squares off at them and calls them hypocrites, which means they're big actors. They're playing a part and putting on a mask, and it's not really who they are. And that's what a hypocrite is. It's somebody who pretends to have a quality about their life, and yet the way that they demonstrate it is antithetical to what they say they believe. It's, you know... It's like my dad smoking a cigarette and saying, if I ever catch you smoking, I'll rip your arm off and beat you to death with it. <laughs> it's pretty much hypocrisy. And he told us never to drink while he had a beer in his hand too. So you know what it is. But the funny thing is there's, there's a little hypocrite in all of us because we know far more than what we do. And I think that's the point for us. And we have to kind of come to grips with that. It's easy to identify hypocrisy in everyone else, just like finding a speck in someone else's eye. Sometimes it's like carrying around a beam in your own when you don't recognize your own. So Jesus speaks this to us so we can keep an eye on what's going on. Beginning here in verse 1. In the meantime, in other words, while all of this was going on, he was reproving all of the Pharisees and publicly. In the meantime... When an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, 
which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. After that, have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. Also, I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him, the Son of Man, also will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Now, when they bring you to the synagogues and the magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you that very hour what you ought to say. Then one of the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. You can always count on one interrupter. But he said to him, man, I love how he says that, man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. For he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. He thought within himself saying, what shall I do? Since I have no room to store my crops. And so he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So that's what those pictures have in common. Jesus talks about all of these things. And it's about our accountability before God for the things that we do in this life. With our time, with our treasures, with our talents, with all of it. So as we begin here in verse 1, in the meantime, I, I, I love this little parenthetical in the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together, that means there was a ton of people, like thousands of people, like at a concert or maybe a Black Friday sale. <laughs> and they trampled one another, much like you might find at Walmart when they open on Black Friday. I'd, it's an amazing thing that out of the love of your heart, because you want to get a good deal and buy a gift for someone you dearly love, you will trample over strangers and play tug of war with a flat screen TV because they're limited. Because you love them so much that you will kill anyone that gets in your way. It's kind of like that. They trampled one another and they began to say to the disciples first, Jesus began to say to his disciples first of all, now he's speaking to his disciples, not the crowd. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Uh, that's a nice oozy bunch of dough right there, full of leaven. It, it probably was a small little ball of dough at one point, and then the leaven taking over and doing what it does, the bacteria inside begins to have a byproduct of gas. 
Yes, that's what makes those lovely little holes in the bread is gas from bacteria. When you're made at one in the morning, has that happened? You don't th feel fluffy at all. You don't feel good at all. When the covers go, Poof. my wife will tell you. But that's what produces that. By the way, that's how alcohol is made too. It's the remains of what happens when bacteria, anyway, you don't need to know all this. Leaven. Leaven in the, in the scripture is always likened unto sin. And sin is likened unto it because it's pervasive. It just goes everywhere. In fact, Jesus in chapter 16 of Matthew says this. Now, when the disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. They didn't pack a lunch. And Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So this is another time when he uses this example of the leaven. And then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread because they felt, oh no, he knows we didn't pick up lunch. He's mad at us. And he goes, no, 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 no. You, you guys have no idea what I'm talking about. Listen, it's the leaven of the Pharisees. The doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees is what he's talking about. He's talking about teaching, bad teaching. Bad teaching is leaven. So the loaf of bread would be the understanding of the knowledge of who God is. And the leaven would be the contaminant, which is thrown in there, which just makes it go absolutely wild. What leaven does is it sours the bread. Did you know that? You ever have sourdough? It's because there's a certain kind of bacteria that's in there. It sours, it swells, it spreads, and lots of other S's I didn't include. And corrupts secretly, but completely. And that's the way Jesus refers to sin in our lives. If we allow a little piece of it, a little leaven, leavens the whole loaf of bread. It doesn't just stick to one piece. And the way that they would perpetuate this is they would pull off a piece from the previous loaf, and then they'd make their bread and they'd hold on to this piece that has leaven in it, and they would add it to the new one. And that's how they would perpetuate the leaven. And it just continues to proliferate. Sin is like that in our lives. And he says, beware of this leaven, this contaminant, this bacteria, uh, the doctrine of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He's in the midst of telling them that they're all about a performance, that they keep the law and try to do what's good for the sake of other people seeing them. And our world is so focused on the exterior. So Jesus is telling you and I to beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which is hypocrisy, which is play acting. Hypocrisy is claiming to have moral standards which one's own actions do not confirm. Somebody said that. It's hiding behind a face. Uh, I, I see people do this sometimes on Sunday morning. They walk in and then I see them and they go, hi. I call that frosted flakes. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of, oh, hi. Some of you are a bit more honest. You look up and you go, hi. <laughs> and I like that because now, now I know I need to hug you. So, but don't manipulate me that way. I don't like that. So. That's what it is. And he says, don't do that. Don't pretend to be something that you're not. Beware of this teaching. Be religious. Do everything on the exterior. Look like you're doing everything right when in your heart it's, it's a mess. Don't do it. Only a true believer fears hypocrisy, whereas the hypocrite himself feels safe from it. A good hypocrite will say, I got this handled. I can, I can make everyone believe something on the outside. And so a real hypocrite doesn't worry about hypocrisy. So if you're convicted about it, the chances are that the Lord's working on your heart and, and removing that leaven from your life. Amen? Amen? And that's a good thing. There is nothing covered that will not be revealed nor hidden that will not be known because God sees and knows everything. I can't follow my children. I can't follow my grandchildren everywhere, but God does. And so I don't worry about the things I can't see. 
Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear and the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. Jesus is saying, beware of hypocrisy because God knows. God knows the truth. He knows who you are. He knows really what's going on in your heart. He knows whether you have a lot of victory or you have no victory. He knows whether you have a secret sin or not. God knows all that. And one day it's going to be public. That's a little scary. I, I wouldn't want you to know everything that's on my mind. Sometimes you can tell because I open my mouth. But other than that, you don't know what's on my mind. I don't know what's on yours. It's scary to think that God sees all that stuff and he loves you anyway. He loves you anyway. So he's going to shine the light on everything and it's all going to be exposed. That's something we should think about because if there's hypocrisy in our life, it's, you're not getting away with anything. There's no, hey, nobody knows it's a secret. There's no such thing. Can you imagine the secrets? of people that will have to stand before the judgment seat and give an account for the things that they've done, regardless of how they put on a performance. Did you know one of the most insecure people that ever lived was Adolf Hitler? But you'd never know it by his body uh, language, by his speech, by everything that he stood for and the way that he spoke. If you've ever seen uh, a recording of him speaking or listening to him, you would never think this guy was insecure, but he was incredibly. So he put on a persona on the outside to win the hearts of the people, and yet he himself was incredibly insecure. I think to some degree, we all live with a little bit of hypocrisy in our life, where we want people to think the best of us instead of thinking of us as we truly deserve to be thought of. I think about Jimmy Swaggart years ago, 1980s. He was a big deal. He had followers galore. And he came down really hard on sexual sin. He started accusing famous leaders of Christian ministries, processed lawsuits against them, and was involved in all kinds of stuff. He was one who leaned on the bakers, if you remember them. And he, he exposed them and said, shame on you, and just was raking them over the coals. This is the doctrine of the Pharisees. And of course... He was busted himself, involved in prostitution. And he, he had that famous confession on TV published where he begged for forgiveness and say, he said, I have sinned. I don't buy it. It's a big performance. Because a few years later, he got busted again. And the guy's still in ministry. Hey guys, if I cheat on my wife and if I have a prostitute on the side and if I continue to do this, I deserve to be fired instantaneously. Okay? Bill, Bill will do it. <laughs> He's the hatchet man. <laughs> Jesus said, all of the things that are secret are going to come up. And you know, sometimes it happens in this life and not just before the throne of God. Sometimes it comes up here. Because it's hard. It's really hard to keep a lie down, especially if the Lord's in your life. It's a real hard thing to keep a secret. So, 1 Peter 2, 1 says, Therefore, lay aside all malice, that means a pre-thought of doing harm to someone, all deceit, which means trying to pretend things are different than they really are, hypocrisy, which is pretending to be something you're not, envy, and all evil speaking, when you speak denigration towards someone trying to destroy their character to someone else. We're told to remove this. By the way, this letter is to believers. And it's understood that these things are still leftovers in our life, that the world is constantly pollinating leaven into our life. And our flesh, which has grown up under many years of careful teaching, not in the scriptures, that we're to put this aside. In Christ, we can do that. Without Christ, you don't have the power to do it. You're going to be a, a slave of your, of your DNA. You're going to be a slave of your background. You're going to be a slave to your own choices, and you're not going to be able to do anything. But once we have a relationship with God, he forgives us of our sin, and he sends the Holy Spirit. We have the ability to live free. And Jesus said, I have come that they might have freedom. That's why he came, so that we're not, we're not under that bondage. 
Jesus says here in verse four, and I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. By the way, you're going to see fear and afraid mentioned six times in this little section. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, after that, have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he is killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Jesus says, don't be afraid of somebody who can kill the body. You know how many people can kill your body? Everybody. We're all very vulnerable. I don't know if you know that. Your heart just has to stop for a little while. Breathing just needs to be impeded for a little while. We're incredibly vulnerable. A right hit or a right pinch or the removal of a vital part and you're done. That causes people to worry. Oh no, I have a pain. I wonder if I'm dying. Is that my, <laughs> is that my kidney? So, oh, I feel a little tightness in my chest. I don't know, am I, what? Uh, maybe it was the dryer sheet stuck in my shirt. You know, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes these thoughts fly into my mind and you know, like so many birds in my attic, I gotta get rid of them. Jesus said, don't worry about somebody who can kill the body because that's all they can do. What's the worst you can do? Kill me? Well, yes, that's a big deal, right? Jesus said, don't, don't worry about somebody who's gonna kill you. Don't worry about anybody that can kill you. Don't worry about heart attack. Don't worry about cancer. I mean, don't put it into your body, but don't worry about it. Don't be afraid of that. Why don't you have a fear of God? And the thing is, you want to cure your fears and your anxieties? A greater fear is what's going to cure you. Like standing on a roof and jumping off. I, I am afraid. I am afraid of Draculia. I'm, I'm afraid of things like jumping off roofs unless there's a fire behind me. And that's a greater fear. And so I'm going to jump. A greater fear will eliminate your fear. He says, don't be afraid of that stuff. Anybody can kill you. Be afraid of God. Why aren't you living with the ever present knowledge that he's watching and listening to every word? In fact, he loves you so much. He can't keep his eyes off of you. The remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. That's the wonderful scribe Oswald Chambers. If you fear God, you won't fear anything else. If you don't fear God, you'll be afraid of everything else. So that's the cure. Jeremiah 1.8 says, do not be afraid of their faces. It's an interesting statement. This is at the very beginning of Jeremiah where he's talking about his ministry and he's going to go and talk to the people of God and they will not listen. And God tells him, by the way, I'm calling you into the ministry. <laughs> Hooray, but no one will listen to you. <laughs> you know, when you think you have it bad, read Jeremiah. Do not be afraid of their faces. How many of you are sensitive to people's faces? Only a few of you. I'm amazed. We can become so dependent upon other people's approval that we straightjacket ourselves. We can make ourselves so fearful, which is the bottom line of it, of other people's opinions and whether they approve of us or not. Proverbs 29, 25 says, fear, the man, fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. We get afraid of all kinds of things. Well, the economy, politics. I mean, have you looked at the news today? There are a lot of things that we can be fearful of. And the scripture says, don't be afraid of any of that stuff. Fear God. Because that's ultimate judgment. There's a book called uh, When People Are Big and God is Small by uh, Edward Welch. It's a, it's a really, really good book if you want to take a look at it. 
it is kind of the cure and highlights things like codependence, peer pressure, people pleasing, not trusting God, seeking shallow approval from other people and avoiding pain and conflict by um, basically kowtowing to other people. It's, if you're that kind of a person where people's facial expressions, you kind of hang on and are you mad at me? Are you, are we okay? I mean, I, I know I've been thinking, you know, yesterday I said something to you and I, I don't know. I, you, know you guys ever get that one? <laughs> okay. I'm just trying to be honest. I think we all have to deal with that kind of stuff. Am I going to do something that's uh, unapproved? And yet I believe God would have me do. The reason I don't do it is because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of approval. I'm afraid I need it. And it's death. To be a people pleaser is death because you don't really have a life of your own. You have a life that is modeled by everyone you spend time with and they control you like a puppet. And if you're not careful, you find somebody who enjoys that kind of personality and that's what they'll do with you. And you'll hate yourself and you hate them and you hate your life. It happens. <laughs> this is the opposite. I'm in love, I'm in love, and I don't care who knows it. When you just do what God wants you to do, you're going to look silly. You're going to say stupid things. You're going to tell people your shortcomings and your failures. And it's, I'm in love, I'm in love, and I don't care who knows it. That is a fearless life. So next time you watch Elf, you can remember that Jesus said, do not be afraid. Because this guy's not afraid of anything. Mostly because he has no mind, but <laughs> the character, not the actor. It's kind of like uh, Kevin. Do you remember when Kevin said, do you hear me? I'm not afraid anymore. You guys remember that in Home Alone? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Because it is Christmas is coming. Did you know that? It's coming close. I put these things up here because I think maybe they'll remind you to buy a gift for someone. And Jesus says, are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? Well, that's a strange question because none of you have bought sparrows with copper coins. Not one of them is forgotten before God, but the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore, for you are of more value than many sparrows. Jesus reminds us that sparrows, you know, these little teeny birds, you can buy five of them for two pennies, at least back then, the economy's changed since. But they were so inexpensive because there were people that caught birds and you can catch them, you know, virtually anywhere. And they were cheap. And yet, even though it was so little money and it's such a small thing and it's a bird, God knows about it. And not one of them is forgotten by God. He knows where every single one of them is. He's the, he's the one that keeps that little heart beating and the little voice speaking. And you know, they don't seem to be afraid of anything, do they? They're not worried about the economy or who's in the White House or who's in the Supreme Court and what's going on. They, they don't worry about any of that stuff. And they sing. You know, and there's not one of them that God doesn't know about. They're inexpensive small amount of money, you can get five of them, and yet none of them is forgotten by God. So why do you think he forgot about you? That's, I have to preach to myself that. It's like, oh, 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 oh. Where's God? Where's God in all this? Is he here? Does he care? Those are questions that go through my mind, and he does. And he is here. And he says this interesting thing, that you're, the hairs of your head are numbered. Numbers always changing. <laughs> you know, the average human being has about 140,000 hair follicles. And it doesn't say that he knows the total sum. He says they're numbered. Like this is one, this is two, and this, is, this is 1,957. This one's 9,000, you know, they're numbered. That's how intimate God is with you. So why would you think he forgot about you? Oh, there goes another one. 
He knows about it. So why, why are you upset about it? Did God allow that to happen? Are you mad at him? Do not fear. That's what the scripture tells us. Do not fear. Fear will do this to you. It will put a straitjacket on you to where you can't think clearly. And you're not going to be able to communicate with God. Your fellowship with him is done. Because you have taken the weight of the world on your own back and you're trudging through life trying to deal with everything on your own. And guess what? We stink at it. We mess things up. That's why we need the Lord. You will straightjacket yourself. So don't be afraid. Verse 8. Also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man also will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. This is what's known as the unforgivable sin. You, you thought it was adultery. In 2 Timothy 2, verses 11 to 13, it says, this is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, like we celebrated this morning, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him, which is the proof that God is in your life. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. Aren't you glad for that? Because there are times when we're unfaithful and in so doing, it's kind of like we're denying Christ. But if you really know him and if he's really made the change in your life, you can't stay there. You can't. Because if the spirit of God is inside you, you can't continue to live in sin. You can't. Scripture says so very clearly. So, you'll be forgiven. It's an interesting process. Rejecting the Holy Spirit, the special kind of rejecting the Holy Spirit that they did when Jesus here was on the planet, was he was doing miracles in front of these guys, and they were saying, oh, well, that's the work of the devil. And he said, you guys aren't going to make it. You're blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which is attributing the works of God to the devil. The way that we are going to be unforgiven if we ever get to that place is turning the Holy Spirit off. Where is the Holy Spirit's ministry today? Inside. So how do you blaspheme the Holy Spirit? You know when you feel bad about something, but you rationalize it away? You say, no, it's okay. God will forgive me. Or that's not God speaking. That's just my own conscience. Are you not blaspheming the Holy Spirit? When God speaks to you, he speaks to your mind. He speaks to your heart. A word comes from this place or from the word of God or as you're on your knees or from someone else. And you say, nah, not going to do that. God didn't tell me that. That's just my imagination. And you continue in that until your last breath. That's unforgivable. That's the end. The book is closed. No more choices. And we'll have to stand before God and give an account for everything that we've ever said. And we'll have to pay the price if Jesus hasn't done it for us. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is like strike three. Jesus said, the Father... You can, you, can, you can speak against God. You can shake your fist at God. You'll get forgiven. You can do that to Jesus. In fact, they did when they hung him on the cross. They reject God when you reject the law, the entire Old Testament, which the Pharisees were already doing. You reject Jesus when you hang him on the cross and you put him to death. You reject the Holy Spirit when inside of you, you say, nah, I'm going to do what I want to do. And it's interesting if you know anything about the Bible in the book of Acts in chapter 7, Stephen is pulled up and Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul the Apostle, is there orchestrating an assassination of Stephen, who's a deacon, by the way. So watch out, deacons. 
And Stephen says this after a beautiful sermon, which he never prepared because he didn't do it in advance. He says at the very end of it, you stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Well, they didn't take very kindly to his words. They tore their clothes and they picked up stones and they stoned him to death right there. And Jesus makes a personal appearance. The sky is open and he gets a vision of where Christ is in heaven and he goes, I see Christ seated at the right hand of the Father, probably with his hand out, receiving him to heaven. Now that's a pretty good exit right there. That's a good exit. If you blaspheme the Holy Spirit and you say, shut up, eventually he will. And you'll be left with no choice. That's strike three. In Ephesians 4, 29 32 says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. In other words, we say things that are good for other people. It's good for their consumption. It's true. It's right. It's kind. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. This is written to the Christians. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. By whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. That's a really good admonition right there. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. How do you grieve the Holy Spirit? By not putting off bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, malice, and not being kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving. That's how you, it's not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, but that's how you burden the Holy Spirit. By the way, an it, you can't hurt an it's feelings. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, which is God, his spirit. And yes, you can hurt the Holy Spirit's feelings, if you will. Don't grieve the spirit. You know, when you do something and the Holy Spirit goes, oh, not again. <laughs> Dave, don't, come on, didn't we go through this last time? I don't know about you, but that's the way God talks to me. When he's grieved, he lets me know, and I feel it because he's part of who I am. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, when they bring you to synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry. Did you hear that? Do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit, the very one that we're told not to blaspheme, will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So if God is with you, he's going to be with you to help you to know what to say. If that was not the case, I could not do this job. And if it's the same for me, it's the same for you. Without the Holy Spirit, yeah, we have reason to be worried because we've got to manufacture stuff and say stuff and oh my goodness, maybe somebody's going to poke holes in our theory and you know, we have to get all twisted up because maybe we're found vulnerable. And yet here it says, don't worry. Don't worry about what you're going to say. When you get arrested because you're a Christian or they say, listen, you know, uh, we're going to force you to do this or the government comes marching in your door or they come marching in that door, do not worry. You know why he says that? Because it's the first thing we do. In our flesh, that's what we do. We don't say, oh, cool, a challenge. <laughs> Lord, you, ha you love me so much you're sending this challenge to me to make me more like you. Lord, I, I would just want to worship you right now. <laughs> you know, we don't have that tendency to see through this onslaught and react well. And yet we should. Don't worry. Do not worry. The scripture says do not worry. You know what happens when you worry? You sin. Against God. You're being disobedient. You're grieving the Holy Spirit. You grieve the Holy Spirit when you worry. Should you ask God to forgive you when you worry? Absolutely. Should you ask him for strength? Absolutely. Should you cut it out? Do not worry. Right? I think about 
Peter and John, Peter and John went to the temple in the afternoon and there's, there's a guy, a poor guy laying outside and he's lame and he's outside the, the temple and he's collecting alms. And you know, it's like the homeless people in New York City, they have their hand out and they don't make eye contact. And he's asking for alms and Peter walks up and says, listen, silver or gold we don't have. But what we have, we give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. Before he said that, he said, look at me. Because he wasn't making eye contact. And he grabs him by the hand and he pulls him up. And the guy leaps to his feet for the first time in his life. Everybody that went into the temple that day saw him pass by, probably put a couple coins in his hand and, you know, said a prayer for him or whatever. These guys didn't have any money. They said, well, I don't have anything to give you except this. How about your legs working from now on? In the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. Do you know that they were pulled into court for this? They were pulled into court for healing on the Sabbath. But that's what Jesus did all the time. Kind of like in your face. <laughs> Jesus did that all the time to tradition. Because he could do whatever he wants. And what he says is, don't worry about it. And they called him up and they said, listen, you, you know, you're healing on the Sabbath. You guys got to cut this out and you're preaching in the name of Jesus. And we don't want to hear Jesus' name anymore because, because we killed him. So we don't want to hear that because we feel bad every time you mention his name. And he said, listen, if it's for a good deed that we're, we're called here, you know, um, if you're telling us to not preach in Jesus' name anymore or not to heal in his name anymore, then I want you to be the judge. Should we do what you say or what God says? That was a pretty wise answer. You know, he didn't sit in an office and think of this. It came out at the moment, which is why you can trust the Holy Spirit to give you what to say at the moment. And it will be incredibly, I've had a couple of events when the Spirit of the Lord gave me something to say, and it was just, it was better than I could have manufactured. Do not overthink it. That's another way of worrying, by the way, is overthinking it, and you think about it, and you think about it, and you think about it. Do not ruminate on it. It's when you go over it and over it and over it. What if they ask me this? What am I going to say? Oh, I, I know what they're doing. I know what they're thinking. And I, I know what's going to happen. No, you don't. You have no idea. So why worry about it? It's like, it's like paying for a, a, a cruise and getting a ticket that will never leave the dock. Why would you do that? Do not obsess about it. How many of you are overthinkers, obsessors? Worry. Fear. Fear is the root cause, and it's because we're not involving him. So, is there no God? Is he not your father? Is he not present? Does he not have his hand upon you? Did he not send his son, Jesus Christ, to show you how much he incredibly loves you? Why would he withhold anything from you? So why worry? Then one of the crowd said to him, teacher, just interrupted him in the middle of teaching, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Sometimes this happens on a Sunday. We'll have somebody say something, but nobody today, I notice. Perhaps because we're here. <laughs> but he said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? This guy doesn't even know Jesus. And he walks up to him because he's teaching and he has authority. He says, listen, I, I'm going to get you. It's, it's like the husband and wife that come up to me and the wife says, you have to talk to my husband. <laughs> and I say, I do? Yes. Honey, tell him. <laughs> and then I try to come in out of the hallway, away from all the people, and close the door and have a conversation with him alone. Say, what the heck's going on here? I'll use the words of Jesus if one of you comes up to me like that. And I'll say, man, who made me a judge between you two? Does Jesus possess the ability to be a judge? 
Oh, absolutely. Does he decide that you guys need to work this thing out on your own? Hey, I'm not getting what I want. I want you to add pressure so I get what I want. That's what he's saying. I know you good people would never do that, but who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he has. Now I have more slides all the way up to chapter, all of verse 21, but I'm going to end it with this slide. Because I love you people. So in the middle of the crowd, the guy comes up and says, I got a problem. My brother isn't sharing the inheritance. Now, it's an interesting thing in their culture. The person who would handle the inheritance is the older. They would instantly be the executor. And they would get a double portion, by the way. So if they divided your property into fours because you had siblings, you would get two out of the four, and the remaining two siblings would get the other portions. It's just why it stinks to be the middle or last child or somewhere in the middle. But he's got a problem because this is really not Jesus' thing. He's here to deliver souls from death, not make sure there's an equitable distribution of funds in your family. And it's none of his business, really. It's just not. That's what he's saying. It's none of my business. But I will tell you something about your heart. You need to be careful that you don't have covetousness because your life is not about the stuff. Your life is not about the accumulation of wealth, things, how many storage facilities you have to fill with extra things you don't see and don't even remember what's in them. It's not about the size of your house and how much storage you have in it and your basement loaded with things in your garage and vehicles that are parked that have to stay in a charger all winter because you don't ride them and I have a motorcycle, so I'm, I'm talking about me. Stuff. You know stuff. You've got to carry stuff. You've got to clean stuff. You've got to repair stuff. You've got to polish stuff. You've got to paint stuff. You've got to repair stuff. Stuff is a burden. Stuff is not a blessing. Oh, what a blessing. I've just, I've just won the lottery. Oh, I'll pray for you. Because those situations don't end well. Rarely. Some people are so poor, all they have is money. Talk to people who are wealthy, who, and you say, hey, how many friends do you have? None. You don't have any friends? When money is your God, you'll alienate everyone else because you're afraid they're going to put their hand in your pocket. Covetousness is desiring more of what you have enough of. Covetousness is desiring more of what you have enough of. If it's food, it's called gluttony. I'm just saying. Covetousness is desiring more of what you have enough of. Do you have enough? Yes. You know what the opposite of covetousness is? Thankfulness. Contentment. Gratefulness. Reminds me of Scrooge. Christmas references all day. It reminds me of Scrooge. I don't know if you saw the one with Jim Carrey's voice in it, but boy, they did a really good job with that. Money was the most important thing. Covetousness. He was not happy. Not happy. Until he started giving it away. It's no different with us, guys. It's no different with us. I hope you guys are finding this enjoyable as the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and pulls up issues that we all need to deal with, by the way. And we're not all that different from one another. We all struggle with these things. Jesus said, do not fear. Do not fear. Don't be worried about what other people think. Don't be worried about what their faces look like. Don't be worried about all that kind of stuff. Fear God and you won't fear anything. If you don't fear God, you'll fear everything. Mm -hmm.